Go ahead. Welcome everyone to the Great Lakes Renewable Energy Association's 2024 Renewable Energy Seminar for May 9th, 2024. Tonight we're going to talk about a new guide that has been produced called the Michigan Solar Shopping Guide. I'm your host, Mark Cleavy. I'm a lifetime member of GLREA and former member of the board. Um, our presenters tonight are Tom Stanton, former Michigan Public Service Commission um, Maven, uh, I say, Wayne Appiard, who is the former chair of the Ann Arbor Energy Commission, and Juliet Knight, who is with the University of Michigan Environmental Sciences Program. Great Lakes Renewable Energy Association um, has been around and formed since 1991. We are a uh, 501c3 nonprofit organization supported by our members who pay us to educate and advocate for renewable energy in Michigan. You can learn more about GLREA's membership opportunities at our website, www.glrea.org or contact our executive director, John Freeman. The GLREA Solar Star Stories are part of a large uh, system that uh, each Thursday of every month, um, one of them is going on. First Thursday of each month is Ann Arbor Solar Stories. Second Thursday, which is tonight, is the Renewable Energy Seminar that I host. Third uh, Thursday is the Detroit Solar Stories. And the fourth is uh, Solar Stories in Michigan and Energy Questions and Answers. Our Renewable Energy Seminar covers topics of interest to renewable energy users, businesses, advocates, and stakeholders. Seminars include content ranging from technology to business to public policy. Our, our Renewable Energy Seminar is a Zoom event, again, held every Thursday from 7 to 8. Related questions and comments and suggestions should be directed to me, Mark Cleavy host, and that's my email, mcleavy123 at gmail.com. We ask that you please remember to mute yourself. Please hold all questions until the end of the presentation. Raise your hand on the reactions to ask a question and the host will contact you or call on you for your questions. The question about whether solar is feasible or not, this uh, cartoon goes a, a ways back. Um, I pulled it out of several different places, but the answer as you will learn tonight is, yes, solar is feasible, quite feasible, contrary to what we're told. Um, and uh, contrary to how our rate dollars are used to tell people that it isn't feasible, it is feasible, and how to optimize that decision we will discuss tonight. GLREA has a long history of solar education. Tonight, I wanna to welcome Tom Stanton, formerly, again, the Michigan Public Service Commission, Wayne Appiard, and of course, Juliet Knight, um, to talk about the new Michigan Solar Shopping Guide. It's intended for people who are starting to shop for a new solar system in Michigan or expanding a current solar system in Michigan covers many of the most important basic ideas, providing links and references to where you can learn more. Tonight, our speakers will present the report and invite listeners to contribute to the conversation and ask questions about your own shopping experiences. And so without further ado, I wanna turn the floor over to Juliet Knight, who will serve as tonight's uh, moderator. Juliet. Hello, um, thank you, Mark. Good evening, everyone. I'm proud to introduce Wayne Appleyard. He is an architect and co-founder of Sun Structures Architect. Wayne has also been designing energy efficient and solar buildings for 50 years. Next, we have Tom Stanton, who is an independent clean energy policy consultant. He is the founder and principal researcher for Community Energy Solutions, which is a newly formed Michigan company. He was previously principal researcher for energy and environment at the National Regulatory Research Institute, along with working for the Michigan State Government for over 32 years. Now I'll be passing, up to, passing it off to Tom and Wayne to introduce the 2024 GLREA Michigan Residential Smart Solar Shopping Guide. Oh, thank you very much, Juliet. And you should all know that Juliet started work on this guide uh, with us uh, last summer when she was working as an intern for GLREA and we're very happy to have uh, brought the project to a first completion here. We've got about 40 minutes to talk and we'll be taking your questions. Uh, please type questions as you think about them or discussion topics into the Q&A tab on your Zoom meeting and uh, Juliet will help organize them for us when we get to the end here. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm not going to read slides to you. We're going to go pretty quickly so that we have plenty of time for discussion. But you should be aware of these three points. These are the three things we want you to understand when we're done with tonight's presentation. 
uh, first one that some kind of solar option is practical for nearly every single person in the state of Michigan, one way or another. And then there's a need for people who are buying to do their own education and learn for themselves and be ready to shop before they go shopping. And then the third point here is that there's a big difference between trying to produce solar energy for your own use, which our laws in Michigan call self-service power. And that's very different from someone who wants to be in the business of generating solar electricity that they will then sell to a utility or someone else, usually at a wholesale price. Let's go to the next one, please. So these are the seven major sections of our guidebook. And you've got a link to the guidebook in the chat here on this meeting. And when you get the PDF of this presentation, wherever it says available here, there will be a hot link that takes you to the place where you can find that particular information. Uh, let's go to the next slide and turn it over to Wayne for a minute. Sure. Uh, it's it's important to realize that um, solar does work in Michigan. It is a very good investment, and uh, it's pretty much risk free. You know, once you get it installed and up and running, it just sits there. There's very little maintenance involved with it, and um, in addition to paying for itself in eight to twelve years, it actually increases the value of your home. Um, <clears throat> Additionally, the 30% uh, tax credit uh, from the government is gonna continue uh, until 1932. And you can take more than one year to recoup that if you need to. Um, and, you know, the price of solar has come down and it's sort of fluctuating now. It's, um, and batteries are gonna be reduced in price probably some over, over the next few years, but now is really a good time to do it um, because now you're starting to immediately uh, reduce your carbon footprint and uh, <laughs> what we're doing to the planet. So um, next slide. So in, so, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. All right, Wayne, um, the simplest kind of installations that people can make now are integrated with electric utilities for what they call parallel operation. That means your loads inside the building can be served either by the power that is coming from the outside grid through the utility, or it can be served by your solar energy system into the house. And those parallel operations use what the utilities either call net metering or they call distributed generation rates. And those rates, uh, unfortunately, are different for every utility company in the state. Most of them will limit your solar production to not more than 110% of your average annual energy use, which they will always check to make sure you're not installing a system that is too big for your use. Uh, and then there may be other limits based on how much roof space you have or how much yard space you have for mounting solar panels. And if you add new electric loads, either right from the outset or later, the utility will go through a process of estimating your total usage to make sure you're not exceeding the 110%. And these size limits apply if you are going to enter into a working arrangement with the utility to uh, have excess energy be exported to the grid. If you're not, if your system is all off site, then those size limits are not going to apply. And so we the, well, one thing to show on that slide, if I might, is that it's important to realize that it varies from month to month and from year to year as far as what you're going to get. So um, you're not gonna get everything that you need in December necessarily, but on an annual basis, it's gonna work out. And certainly when I did my system, um, I installed and it had an air source heat pump installed virtually a few months before I installed the system. And at least consumers was just fine with, with going with the larger system. So um, highly recommend doing things in that order. Next yeah, time. we should have mentioned that that data comes from Wayne's uh, home installation. 
So part of uh, part of what you can potentially do is add storage, which um, for those of you who obviously won't be having uh, net metering, you'll only get a certain portion, about half of uh, what you, uh, the charge that you pay for electricity, you only get about half or less than that back from the utility. So adding storage will help your return on investment, although storage prices are still fairly high. So it's important to kind of look at the numbers um, and if nothing else, make your system storage ready so that you can add it later on. Um, and electif what we need to do from a climate change prospect is to really electrify everything. So electric vehicles, electric lawnmowers, electric, uh, um, ranges, the whole deal. Very good. Next slide. So we, I want to mention these things, and we're not going to talk much about these, these tonight, but if you have interest, then um, please talk to us later about off-grid home systems that can be any size and can also be portable what we call now plug and play or plug in solar, or in Europe, they call it balcony solar, <laughs> where you can spend as little as about $300 to buy one panel and the equipment you need to plug that into your home circuits, or as much as about $3,000 for more panels that can provide that kind of solar. Community solar, which can happen both with or without a utility company that is participating in that aspect. And that can go anywhere from $300 on up. Uh, there is proposed legislation for community solar in Michigan and GLREA is working uh, on getting that legislation to pass. But until the state of Michigan will pass comprehensive legislation enabling community solar, uh, we could say that most Michigan utilities are not uh, being very progressive when it comes to enabling those technologies. You can also, if you're interested in solar, but you don't have a good opportunity in your own building, there are many ways that you can invest in solar energy, either by investing in a particular solar project, financing or helping to finance a particular project, or buying solar equities uh, typically is done through a kind of a mutual fund that will invest in several different solar companies to uh, help balance out the risks. And those go anywhere from $100 on up. Uh, we can go to the next slide, please. Actually, I heard a, a thing today that somebody had, had done a study of climate scientists. And they said probably the most important thing that you could do is push for politicians that are promoting climate change work. So, which brings us to this slide. Um, <clears throat> GLREA has a great program um, putting in, uh, helping locality, lo excuse me, uh, local places um, start solarized programs. So look at what might be near you, or if you wanna get involved, you can help start one. Um, you can also help your community become solar ready, which uh, reduces how hard it is to get permits and, and makes it easier for uh, projects to get installed. Um, and as we talked about um, community solar product projects, um, there's uh, Justice 40 came out. And so now 40% of the government the federal government's um, money is going to be spent on low and moderate income programs. And the the uh, state of Michigan got like $140 million or something like that on it. So that may become um, something that you could help out with. I guess we're on to the next slide. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this slide depicts a little bit about what is called sun path modeling. And this is something you can do for yourself. If you search for this on the internet, you'll see that it's very easy to make a little guide to show you the path of the sun in the winter months and the path of the sun in the summer months. 
so that you can check to see how much shading there would be on your roof and um, where, where the sun will pass through the sky. You can check for uh, both shading and how many hours per day in the winter or the summer that you'll be able to uh, have direct access to the sunlight on your property. We can go to the next. It, it's okay. It's important to realize that um, trees in the winter time are 50% opaque. So don't think that you can get away with a lot of trees and still have good solar output. Um, here is another way that you can figure out uh, what you might have in the way of capacity is to use this PV watts. It's free uh, from the US government and you can go on there you can choose exactly where you live and it'll bring up an image and you can say, well, it's it's this angle and, and this orientation in relationship to south. And the other thing that's important about orientation, if you've got good exposure, even a two and 12 pitch that faces due west is gonna give you about 75% of the optimum that you would have with a, a, a south facing roof. So don't, uh, not do it because you don't have a south facing roof necessarily. You can, you just have to buy some more panels. Next slide. We, in our report, we talk about the solar buying process and what to do when you're shopping for solar to look at all these different aspects and uh, try to help you learn what it would take to find a good, reputable solar company and get them to do the preliminary work and then agree on a contract with them. And uh, usually at the end here, it's the contractor who makes the arrangements for and schedules the local permit inspections that are needed, depending on your installation. It's always an electrical inspection. It may also involve a building inspection. And then uh, the utility company itself will eventually have to give you a permission to operate if you're going to uh, operate in parallel with the utility company. You'll have to read the guidebook for a lot more details there. One important point about choosing a contractor, uh, don't, don't take anybody that's going door to door. Uh, don't take anybody that from an, an, on the net that says you can have solar for free because it's probably a scam. So one of the great things is that uh, GLREA has a very good list of installers as well as Michigan Saves. So it's really important to get the right, per the right company involved uh, in order to have a good output. So next slide. So your detailed agreement uh, will list all the equipment that they're gonna install, um, give you some calculations. Um, and as Tom said, the contractor used to usually deals with the local uh, permits and, and they have to, you, it's important to have them deal with the utility company because they can be a, a real mess sometimes. So as is always the case, don't pay 100% upfront. It's certainly common to have this kind of a schedule where they, you pay them the cost of materials when the materials show up on site and then 90% when everything's installed and save back uh, 10 or 15% until after it's functioning is providing power for you and the utility power, the utility company is, is in line with you. Next slide. The, there are many different ways that you can pay for solar energy systems. Uh, the first one here, pay cash. If you pay 100% upfront, then from that time forward, all of the cost savings will accrue directly to you. A second option could be to include the solar costs in a long-term mortgage, where if the mortgage payments are taking place over 15 or 20 or 30 years, then it's entirely possible that you can arrange for the monthly utility bill savings to be greater than the monthly loan repayments. And that can be very beneficial, of course. 
uh, Michigan Saves is Michigan's nonprofit green bank entity. Uh, they provide financing that comes from Michigan banks or credit unions, and they can typically provide it at a lower uh, interest rate and with pretty generous terms. Um, I just used Michigan Saves to finance my own system. Oh, we could go go to the next slide. Thank you. Sure. So what do you need to do after you have it installed? It's amazing. The, the equipment virtually always works and there's nothing to do. You know, people ask, well, should I try and get the snow off of it? Usually a good sunny day will take the snow off of it. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about that. Uh, a good rain takes any dirt off of it. Um, so, and the great thing is that just about every inverter manufacturer has online um, connections to your equipment. And so you can go on there every day and see how much uh, you're producing and where it's going. And uh, they also have an alert system so that if something is out of whack, uh, they'll actually send you an email uh, that there's something wrong. The data here on the right is from my home system that I had installed and it first started operating in the end of March this year. I was part of the Solarize program here in the Lansing and East Lansing and um, Meridian Township area. There were 11 customers who bought solar during that Solarize program. So we each got an 11% discount on the price. I have both solar and batteries. So when you see these uh, lines on the bar graph here, that's every 15 minutes, four bars per hour. It starts at midnight on the left-hand side and goes to 11.59 uh, p.m. on the right-hand side. In the middle there, you can see the green bars below the line. That is energy coming from the solar and going into storage. And at the bottom, you see the status of the storage going from about 20% up to 100% during that time. And then the, the gray lines below show exports to the grid. And my system is trained to know what the Board of Water and Light rates are so that it is exporting the power during the high priced time of use period between 1 p.m. and 8 p.m., Sun was just setting after 8 p.m. And then we go back to uh, using some of the energy from the storage to finish out the rest of the day. Uh, this was one good sunny day in the month of May. I will be doing a report about how this is working for us uh, to collect data over several weeks and, and provide uh, more detail about it. But it's pretty exciting to us to be able to watch this day by day. And like Wayne said, if there was something wrong, we will start to notice the change in production. And uh, the system actually lets me look at every single micro inverter from all 18 of my solar panels so that I can tell if something is not right with one of those. Go on to the next, please. Here, we've just given you a list from the publication, mostly of the extra resources that are listed in the report that show great sources of information, mostly from Department of Energy and National Renewable Energy Lab, where you can go to learn more. And we can go to the next. Uh-oh. We, we somehow- One hopped. second, the hyperlink. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. So, you can use this time to start typing in your questions. Next slide. <laughs> can we get there? Yep. More resources where you can go to learn more. And some of the subjects we talked about earlier, plug and play solar, when you want to consider uh, using solar to charge your electric vehicle or your, you know, any kind of electric transportation. Um, at the end of that link, notice it says V2G, that stands for uh, vehicle to the grid, V2H is vehicle to the home, and V2L is vehicle to loads. Uh, there's a great guidebook by a former professor from uh, Michigan Technological University called To Catch the Sun. That's available free on the internet. 
And then these business directories at the bottom, GLREA has one, um, the Michigan Property Assessed Clean Energy has a list of contractors and Michigan Saves has a list of contractors. Um, so, you know, those are places you can go to find contractors who we know at least have all the correct licenses and insurances to be able to operate in the state of Michigan. Next. It's important to maybe notice or, or note that some of these you can do right now and some of these are future things. So, for instance, the balcony solar craze, that's not legal in this state at this point. You could probably do it and get away with it. I shouldn't say that, but um, but it's if your utility finds out, they might be upset. Um, and the the vehicle to, vehicle to grid um, does I don't think is really operational. Um, that's going to require the MPSC to do something. Oh, but two companies already offer their vehicles ready to do that. The Ford uh, F-150 pickup trucks will do this. And um, I know there's a second one that's already, oh, one of the Chevy models is already ready for this. But you're right, we probably need rules and regulations to fully enable it. And, and the other thing, the PACE folks, they're contractors that do commercial work because PACE currently is only for commercial projects. So now you might in, be doing a commercial project, in which case that would be a good place to look. Well, and that's true in Michigan, but in some states, they're now broadening pace to apply to residential customers too. So Michigan is not necessarily always in the lead when it comes to <laughs> uh, clean energy policy. Next, please. Now, I've put in here just a couple of slides to talk about the results from the survey that we did as we were working on this report. Juliet helped us develop a survey instrument, and we made two. We sent out uh, one to uh, people who already own solar and asked them to give us information, and we sent out a second one to people who are interested in shopping for solar, but they had not yet made their purchase. And I just put a couple of slides here for you to see some of the results from those surveys. Let's go to the next, please. We got over 125 responses, or no, I guess it was exactly 125, 33 from the group that were saying they were interested in buying solar and 92 from those who said they already had solar installed. It turns out that these people all selected themselves to participate in the survey. And it turned out that about half of them were in the DTE service territory, one quarter in the consumer's energy territory, and the rest were spread out among the smaller um, investor-owned utilities, several municipals, and some of the co-ops. Almost everyone who reported said they use a grid-tied system. And we asked them to tell us what rate they were on with their utility, and there were not 92 different answers, but there might have been 40 or 50 different answers of all people on different rates, depending on when their system was installed. Typically, when the utility changes the rate, people who are already on a contract with the utility get to stay on that contract for as long as maybe 10 years or more before they end that contract and have to go on to a new rate. So that's why we ended up with so many people on so many different rates. And of those people who are shopping for solar, about 80% said they were looking for systems that would interconnect with the grid. But there was another pretty good number that said they're looking for an off-grid option or a community solar option. And then at the bottom here, about 75% of the people who already owned solar said they are already using batteries. And 80% said that they are going to use batteries when they buy their solar systems. So I think it's partly due to self-selection of the people who participated in the survey that we got such high numbers, but that's a very interesting and very high number when we think about how much the batteries cost in addition to the solar panels and the rest of the solar gear. Let's go to the next one, please. A few more of the uh, details about what people said. Uh, over 90% said they're satisfied or more than satisfied or completely satisfied with their installations, which is a pretty high number um, when you compare that to other kinds of consumer goods. 
that people purchase. Uh, there was a huge range in the system sizes that were reported, the smallest ones less than two kilowatts and the largest ones bigger than 15 kilowatts. And just about half of all the systems were seven or smaller. Uh, when we asked people what was their most important reason for purchasing, both groups, the, the ones who are shopping and the ones who already have solar, said that environmental impact was the most important thing to them. And then savings on their utility bill showed up in second place on that. Um, we asked people where they were getting their information that they were using when they were shopping. And the answer primarily came from Google or YouTube, which is not too surprising, but we're hoping that uh, more and more people will take advantage of GLREA information and uh, use that when they go shopping. And then the of the people who said that they were doing the shopping now, they said they plan to purchase within two years or even sooner than that. Uh, next, please. This one just shows a little bit of the range of income. We asked people to express their income in ranges from, say, uh, less than $50,000 a year per the household, all the way up to more than $200,000 per year per the household. And I think the thing to take away from here is that there's a big range and that it does range from people with what we would consider to be very moderate or even low income all the way up to people who are uh, have a lot more income. And the guidebook at the right here in this slide is a guidebook that was made for Michigan about how we can use community solar combined with energy efficiency to help make it possible for lower income people to enjoy solar. So I think we're at the end of the presentation and I hope we're doing good on time and ready to have our discussion with y'all. Thank Great you very time. much for your attention. Juliet, you want to field some questions? Um, I'm unable to see the Q and A um section, but I can't see the chat. So my first, the first question I see is from Dave, and he said, "Is it possible to contact fracking designers to discuss some ideas?" I would say yes, it is that Michigan has some uh, companies that manufacture the different racks and mounting systems for solar and that uh, we could help find a list and uh, Dave could talk to those people. I'm curious, Dave, do you want to take a second and tell us what it is that you're thinking about that might be different or unique? Sure. I'm, I'm going in the area of roof maintenance. Uh, in particular, um, I, I have two ideas that I think at least I would like to discuss with someone who who is in that field. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. well, I know I can help you uh, search for the Michigan companies that are manufacturing those racks and parts, and uh, maybe we can get a conversation going. Uh, Dave, this is Mark. One of the things you want to make sure is that the solar installer, the, the whoever puts up the solar system, that the racks that you're choosing, if you're not choosing them from, from them, um, they may uh, be worried about the warranty coverage. So um, usually, usually racks are sold by uh, your installer. I, I would check to see what first, what kind of a solar system you want first, and then talk to the guy and see what your options are in racking, because they. Uh, they'll be able to choose or help you find racks that they can bring to the table that won't void the warranty on their system. And the warranty will come from the manufacturer. So um, they'll have very specific ways about how those panels need to be mounted and how high above the roof and what kind of materials are used and all that kind of stuff. Sure, that's why I wanted to talk to a designer rather than a, a installer first, yeah. just to yeah. see the fe yeah. feasibility between it. Yes. And then I see Ken's question about um, the difference between uh, centralized inverters and individual panel micro inverters, the pros and cons. Uh, I'm not familiar enough to be able to say exactly what the differences are. Wayne, do you know? Uh, sure. Well, the big difference is what you're getting off the panel. With the 
microinverters like you have, um, what comes off the off of the inverter, which is on the back of the panel, is AC current. And it means that the cables can be a little smaller. Um, the other way is to have one big inverter or perhaps two inverters if you have different orientations. And they usually have what they ha call optimizers on the back of the panels, which tunes the panel and the and the and end phase inverters do as well. They tune the panels so in case there's a little shading or a cloud going over part of the array or something like that, it'll adjust the voltage and the power such that you get the maximum out of your system. Um, so the big difference between the two is um, one big inverter versus a, a lot of little ones and, and uh, the fact that you're getting AC directly off of the panel. Uh, they both have the same requirements as far as automatic shutdown within 30 seconds and or maybe it's 10 seconds and um, things like that. Um, are the, sure warrant, are the warranties essentially the same? Uh, yeah, I believe so. I believe mm -hmm. so. Um, you know, you can you can lose uh, an optimizer, or you can you lose um, an AC panel, um, a micro inverter, without losing the whole system. If your large inverter goes down, it's going to take down the whole system, which is sort of the minus. Um, but on the other end of it, you're putting your AC inverter, which is a little, quite a bit more complex than just a, an optimizer on the back of a panel that's gonna undergo a lot of uh, temperature fluctuations over the years. So there's pluses and minuses. I'll let you know in 22 more years how mine are holding <laughs> out. Anybody else have uh, questions or comments or you wanna have discussion on particular topics? I can, oops, I can uh, comment on the micro inverter idea. That allows the uh, installer to um, honor their warranties without ever bothering you in your house or your factory in my case. Uh, they're uh, easily switched out and usually they'll just come and do it and say, hey, did you notice on the software that this inverter was, uh, you know, failing or or uh, creating an issue somehow? The uh, uh, the other thing about that, I think, is uh, uh, just the control over the system. Like Wayne said, uh, you don't lose the whole system if one panel has snow on it or is in the shaded area, your system still works. In both cases. John, I see. John, John you Thank have you. your hand raised. Yeah, um, so I've got a limited amount of south facing roof and I'm curious, has anybody crunched the numbers with the uh, time of use rates? Uh, I mean, does that actually, west-facing panels actually work uh, rather well, even though you're going to get less total power, but you're going to get it more closely tied to when the utilities' rates are higher? Yeah, exactly. And mine are exactly yeah. facing due west on the west side of our garage roof. We're in an historic district home, so nobody can see the solar from the street. <laughs> that wouldn't be allowed for a historic district, but because it's on the back side of the garage and it faces west, nobody can see it from the street. And then we're getting this really good production during the higher priced hours of the day. I will be considering whether to move on the very extreme price difference. The Board of Water and Light offers two rates, one with a, a shift for everybody that's automatic, but then if you want to take it, you can take one where the uh, on-peak price is about twice as much and the off-peak price is a little bit lower. But that's a very good point. And it, depending on people's lifestyle, there may be a lot of people who use way more in the morning and they want to put some panels facing east. And there may be other people like us where 
Our use during the day is pretty steady, but we want to take advantage of the west facing roof to capture the sun during those hours when the price of electricity is higher. As sort of an aside on this, I think it's important for people to understand that the larger your system is, the more electricity you're going to be selling. So I have a system that was sized to produce all of my electricity for all of my electric home. And on an annual basis, 70% of what I generate goes out onto the grid. Wow. Most of that is in the summer, but um, so... Wayne, we should be clear with people that we're not per se selling electricity. We're getting a credit for it and it gets True. banked. And then in the in the months where we get less solar, we draw back upon those bank of credits. So you're right. Yeah. It is we are selling it in the sense that we get a credit for it, but essentially the grid is acting like a, a battery, even if we mm -hmm. don't have a battery. So, right. Good point. And with somebody who installed their system when net metering was still around, um, the grid is my friend. <laughs> it, it's because I I sell during the day at peak rates and and get it back at night when I when my heat pump runs at a lower rate. Mark, you had your hand raised. Yeah, I was. Um, I've been talking with um, Absolute Solar up in Lansing and Michigan Solar Solutions and Homeland Solar here in Ann Arbor recently, um, and they were talking about um, you know what to, what to expect, what they see happening now that this tariff is going to get kick, get kicking in soon, and how this going to you know is it changing the market? What what are they anticipating? Um, and they were saying that there's an awful lot of dumping going on right now in in, in Michigan, and what appears to be a, a good deal and that and um that i know that that uh some of us still remember that what happened with hot water systems when the solar companies gave solar systems that were going to last 20 years and they lasted for 10 and the company went out of business within the five years earlier than that um so some of these systems you know where that's i guess another point to look at is you know where are these systems coming in if they're if they're you know uh, i've heard that canadian solar may be going out of business so um it's, it's probably some worth looking at at where some of this is coming from. Um, made in America systems are going to be the watchword of the day here in less than 15 days. And right now, there's only a handful of companies, including Meyer Berger, that sells through McNaught McKay uh, in in Michigan, um, that you know will meet the made in America requ requirements. Um, so that's something probably worth looking at and, and considering as you're moving forward. Thank you, Mark. I have a question in the chat from Veronica. Um, she asks, how do the panels affect the longevity of the roof? Does it contribute to uneven wear or aging? Well, it basically protects the roof that it's covering so that that portion will actually last longer. It doesn't increase the degradation on the area that, that um, isn't covered with solar. So it might be that you would, could actually replace the portion of the roof that isn't hidden behind the solar uh, for a lot less than doing the whole project. Um, but um, certainly the, pan the panels protect um, the roofs. Um, so the roof will last longer underneath the panels. And your dealer will inspect the roof before they mount something so that they know that it's okay to mount something before you have to replace the roof. Uh, that's, you know, part of the diligence that has to be done to make sure that the panels can go where you want them to go. Um, and in my particular case, um, they have to leave around the whole edge of the solar installation some space in case um, the fire department has to access that roof or uh, for the code requirements to leave some safety space between the edges of the roof and the edges of the panels.
Juliet, I think there's a question from Harvey in the chat. No, I just asked you about that. Well, I know. <laughs> and uh, But and... I, I don't think Julie can see it. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's private. It's a private chat, so you have to. Yeah, read I'm it. sorry. I did, um, Harvey, I did talk to Dale Klein and he sent an email and I thought he sent it to you, but maybe he just sent it to me directly. So I, I'll follow up with you. Yeah, I didn't see anything. Do you want me to just mention what we're talking about? Yes, go ahead. Okay. This is very superficial at this point, but I had reason to be in touch with DTE about something else. And while I was on the phone with them, uh, the person with whom I was speaking was not real good at articulating answers. So it felt to me like she might not know what she's talking about. She might have known very well what she was talking about and just not a good communicator. But in our conversation, she literally said to me, all the excess credits that you have this is new ever since the dual rates for you know high uh, rates and low rates during the day, time of day rates. She said, you can actually ask us to send you a check for all those credits. And I, I don't see any advantage to asking for that because I'm getting the credits and I'm using the credits and I'm actually remaking my house to be more, use more electricity. So I'll be consuming those credits more rapidly. But that that was the question. I sent a, a message to John about, do you know about this? Is this reality? Might this benefit somebody? So that's what it was. The DTE. I've also, I've also heard about that. And the situation where it might be useful, some customers have a system, particularly if they're on the old legacy net metering versus DG, where they're generating credits in one of the four time of use buckets that they're never actually going to end up using up, right? It's, that that particular bucket has just a credit that's building all the time because right. they're making I'm more power during that time period than, than they're consuming consistently, right? So for them, it would be very helpful. Yeah, John, I, I actually uh, put my panels in uh, just before the, the net zero went away. So I have net zero for a decade. And uh, I think I'm entering my fifth year or something like that. So uh, yeah, I'm one of those people where I, I have a lot of credits. But like I said, I'm doing a big renovation and addition. And I'll probably be consuming way more of those credits than I'm used to because I'm adding a way of heating and cooling the third floor that's a heat pump that's all electric i'm getting uh more electrical appliances uh that that will be more consumptive than i have been so you know we'll see how it goes talk to me in three years <laughs> i think they may have put in that provision also for people at the time they might sell their house and move they can receive the whatever balance credits are left over at that time. Uh, but if the utility writes you a check for excess energy, they will also, I believe, send you a, a tax form where you'll have to tell the IRS that that was income. If you're just exchanging power back and forth with the utility, then uh, the IRS has said, that's okay, that won't count as income. But if you actually receive a check, that may change the status and you might end up having to pay taxes on it. Right. I'm glad you mentioned that because it puts me in a position to actually get a better perspective. It doesn't mean anything in terms of my economics or worrying about taxes or whatever. But all the information gives me a much more realistic perspective. If they weren't such small amounts... I'd say, go ahead and buy them back so DTE has to put out more solar. <laughs> but it's too small an amount. Any more questions, feel free to unmute or just put them in the chat. 
I don't know if anybody wants to try and promote the uh, legislation on community solar at this point, because I think that's probably the most important thing that's going on in Lansing right now as far as solar is concerned. And it would allow a whole lot more people to get solar. I, I just want to mention that uh, Veronica also had a concern if if she puts solar panels on the roof, is that going to trap moisture? And I think it's the case that there's an air gap under the, all the panels. So that's not a concern, but I, I want other people to weigh in that may know That's more. certainly true. You're correct. There's there's plenty of air uh, there for everything to dry out and, and much of the water ends up going off the roof anyways. Um, the only thing that some people worry about is getting critters living behind behind the panels. And so you can get for extra money, you can get a little skirt that runs around the outside that's perforated so that it lets the air go through, but theoretically it'll keep the squirrels out. But not raccoons. <laughs> it's hard to keep raccoons out of anything. <laughs> Well, raccoons carry uh, uh, hardware cloth cutters, <laughs> <laughs> or or the wasps and such. Good point. There's a question from Clyde Taylor. Clyde, you wanted to articulate it, or you want Juliet to read it? You probably can't hear me, John. We can hear you. Oh. Yeah, go ahead, Julie. Just read it. <laughs> okay. Um, does anyone have thin film solar on standing seam roofing? Pite, are you asking if anyone manufactures it or if any of the people on this call have it on their standing seam roofing already? Well, I know that I know that it's manufactured. I just wonder if somebody, anybody had it. I have a couple of buildings that I designed several years ago that have some on it, and they seem to be working okay. But the pricing is such that I, I think the <clears throat> crystalline panels are, are probably a better buy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Wayne, do you want to say something about what that is? I'm not familiar with that. Oh, okay. So, and this goes back to the original company was actually uh, in Michigan, uh, Ovonix, and they actually uh, made what amounted to uh, a thin film of solar PV that went on a flexible membrane and then they applied an adhesive to the back of it, and we called it peel and stick. So it had one of those paper backs on it, and you would actually remove the paper back and roll it out onto the roof, and it stuck to the roof. And there's a, I think it's a French manufacturer now, but I'm not really sure. I haven't looked at it in, in quite a while. I, I actually had a project where it was the first one to, to be quote unquote field applied and uh, it was on a 45 degree pitch and it gla started glaciating down the roof until the wires actually broke uh, on two of the panels and, and somebody had to go up there and scrape it off and replace the panels. Um, and after that, Ovonix always put a screw in the top to keep it from moving <laughs> down the roof. It was designed so that it fit exactly into the space between yeah. the seams on what's called standing seam metal roofs, uh, which are very common installed mm -hmm. all over the country. And so it made a very nice looking installation. But I do think that the separate standalone panels have sort of taken over because it's less expensive to manufacture them. And there are a couple of people that are manufacturing systems that allow it to become the roof using standard panels, including a small outfit out of Ann Arbor that 
put one on my barn roof and it is the roof and mm -hmm. you can access all the electrical from the back side of the panels because it's just sitting on trusses uh, and it hasn't leaked. Uh, so, and if, if it's on an accessory structure, then you can put it on the whole roof because accessory structures are exempt from the fireman's uh, walkway requirement. So Wayne and uh, Tom, we're down to uh, about three minutes before eight. Would you guys like to make any closing comments or Julia? Oh, I really want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. And I would encourage everyone to keep the questions and the discussion ideas coming anytime. Get them to GLREA. Uh, we do plan to treat this somewhat as a living document that can be improved over time as we get more information. When we have this same session 10 years from now, we'll be talking about how all of our clear windows are solar collectors, our siding for our house is a solar collector, the roof is a solar collector. So, you know, the technology is improving in all the time and new things are coming. So I really think it's an exciting time to be in this uh, interest. And thank and do you. Do we have a link to uh, the guide from GLRA's website, or how do, how do we get that? It's in our document, and it's on the chat here at the very beginning. I think uh, Philip and put it in the chat. Thank you, Philip. Okay. Oh, excellent. There it is. Okay. And Juliet oh, just GLRA. Great. and Juliet just put it in as well. Excellent. So I encourage everyone to go and check it out and pass it along. Put a bow on it. Give it out as a Christmas present, along with a membership application to GLRA. Send it to every, every elected official you know. <laughs> and, and Tom's really right in saying that we hope it's a living document. So if people have suggestions, it's one of these things that how long do you make it? How much, how far you get into the weeds and everything? It's we might actually sometime do uh, an appendix that has has more weeds in it. Excellent. Some of us.